love that song. That song suggests that pain can go away. That the bad feelings can disappear. And it's a place where we're going to have to go for me to tell the story of how pain is complex, but it doesn't have to be complicated. So who is this singing lady, and I know I can't sing, so I want you to already know that I know that. My name is Annie O'Connor, I'm a physical therapist. I'm the CEO and founder of A World of Hurt, clinical manager of the Shirley Ryan Ability Lab, formerly known as the Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago. I'm co-author of the World of Hurt book, and I have nothing to disclose relative to the book because I do want you to understand that the proceeds that go to me actually go to feed a research and education fund named the Mike Hage Fund that continues the work in pain mechanism classification at the Shirley Ryan Ability Lab. What's most important is I'm a clinician. I'm a clinician that has been involved in persistent symptoms for 35 years and very humbled by the opportunity to talk with you today. The Pain Summit has a mission, and I love this mission, to create a space to be uncertain and that there's really no definitive answers to how to treat pain. Why do we love this? Because it values the translation of research into practice where we value the end of many, but we also value the N of one where we bring our practice into the research. And so, Please understand that this lecture purposely believes that pain is curable. And I want to present a simple dynamic framework to achieve that outcome. And we will operate around these questions, pathoanatomical or pain mechanisms, the pain continuum, peripheral nervous system or central, pain treatment or pain management, Here's some things I do know. I know 20% of you are not gonna like me. And it's probably because of my Southwest side, Irish Catholic Sox type nature, where my passion borders anger, because that's what we are like in Chicago, especially Sox fans. 40% of you, however, are gonna like me and you're gonna have the same aha moment I had in 1995, when I first saw David Butler speak about this, the simplistic side. And 40% of you are far more qualified to be speaking today than me, so I will humbly continue on. The pain continuum is a less complicated way to think about pain. What is the definition of a continuum? The definition of a continuum suggests that along the path, parts of that continuum are almost indiscernible. But when you look at the extremes, they're very distinctly different. And I know that's what James Syriax was saying when he presented the quote, challenging us about understanding the dynamic transitions that go relative to pain. When he said, hey, to be effective, We've got to somehow reach and reverse the process at its source in a lasting fashion. Because if we don't, and we just allow it to continue, other parts of their lives are gonna become 
even bigger. Maybe the operant issues, maybe even dominate. And let's really remember James because he was the first guy to really bring forth a classification system that went up against pathoanatomical with his idea behind pain and symptom response with certain movements to the point where it was groundbreaking for the field of athletics with the idea behind inert and contractile. Always trying to make pain more simplistic. The definition can actually be interpreted as very simplistic in the sense that, hey, this is a really important function. If you've got an injury or a threat, you're gonna get pain. And this is gonna affect you in a sensory domain. This is gonna affect you in an emotional domain. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether you thought you had an injury, had an injury, or you like to word use words or have been told words that suggest you did. Now, how do we whittle down this complex perception? We whittle it down within our assessment. Meaning we're willing to assess the three dimensions, the sensory dimension, what they feel, the attentional dimension, what they know, how do they think about this? What do they believe? When did it start? And most importantly, we're willing to go into the unknown. How is it affecting their life, their suffering? Because to be honest, as we all know, because we're all clinicians, they know more about them than we know. And even our you know, International Association for Pain has been telling us this is an important assessment in our guidelines. When it says, number one, are you looking at the attentional effective mechanism by understanding the mechanism? Is this a body mechanism, nociceptive? Is this a nerve mechanism, neuropathic? Or is this a nosoplastic brain mechanism? Oh yeah, and let's then attend to other areas relative to sensory. Where, how bad is it? How long has it been there? Even best practice suggests that we've been and should be looking three-dimensional with people. Number one, in a high quality physician practice, no matter where the problem is, back, neck, shoulder, or knee, is are we understanding the concerns of the patient? Are we assessing the attentional effective dimensions? Are we lessening the number one concern that something sinister is going on? And then it reminds us, are we looking into the suffering, the yellow flags, the confidence, the coping, the cognitions, the sleeping, and then set ourselves up to do good exams, monitor those outcomes, show them that they're getting better, or show them that they're not and adjust your interventions by the non-pharmacy, right? The education, the active care, and then look to use the special qualities we all have in manual therapy procedures, pharmacies, and get them back to work. Get them back to fulfilling lives. Now, how do we apply this in practice? Because that's the big gap and we got to mind the gap. And I like to mind the gap with this song. You gotta know when to hold them. Know when to fold them. Know when to walk away. Know when to run. <laughs> I know I can't sing, but I like to think I can. And songs make me remember what I need to do. And one of the things I need to do is make sure I'm minding the gap between, is this a pathoanatomical situation? Is this person seeing me at this time in a place of injury and disease or a red flag? Because if they're displaying certain characteristics that we all know and hold true, 
I would probably use a pathoanatomical model to manage them, and I should. But have they transitioned? Mm. Have they transitioned out of injury into recovery? Mm. Have they transitioned out of disease and into remission? That means I need to manage them differently in pain mechanisms or the pain continuum and understanding the yellow flags because now characteristics are different. They're beyond tissue healing. They're not responding to chemical mediation relative to inflammation. They sometimes don't even really have injury onsets. They're episodic, recurring. Yeah, like life is hard and depression and fear and anxiety and lost hope and confidence are big time players. And Imogene isn't explaining this. This isn't biological markers. These are behavioral markers. And I think that's, you know, kind of, we're in this injury and disease, we're really in recovery and remission. And I think this is where we want to start to say, hmm, what about that pain continuum, right? Because really the biopsychosocial approach that George Engel brought to all of us wasn't static silos, it was a dynamic process. And at any given day, they could be in a different place on that continuum. They could be over here in the pathoanatomical red flag. They could have moved out of that structural thinking into a mechanical where no susception, inflame and ischemia seem to be dominated. They could be not really even relative to local body parts. This could be totally referred and a peripheral nerve element, or they could have moved to something more nosoplastic and even different elements of nosoplastic from central sensitivity, the cognition to affective and coping to motor autonomic and cortical discipline, disinhibition. And we're in a complete nervous system, central nervous system influence. So where are they and which way are they headed? The common language for the pain continuum can be subtitled differently. It could be just simply, yeah, it's peripheral nervous system or central. It could be a nervous system thought process or as the IASP suggests, it could be nociceptive, neuroplastic, nosoplastic, or it could be even whittled down further. I'll never forget the day I saw David Butler present the pain mechanism classification system in 1995. Never will forget. It changed my life. Every intervention that I knew, every approach that I studied at that point finally had a place because no susception can be inflammatory or ischemic. Neuropathic involving the nerve can be entrapment or adherence or both. And even more importantly, the central nervous system, the brain can be central sensitivity, affective motor autonomic. And this is well brought forth in the world of her book the work that was done by Louis and David in 1997 in their journal article carried forward through the smart work in 2010 and 11 and Kolsky and myself in 2016. It has place, it has purpose, and there are discernments between those. Because we can see when you talk about the continuum, right? The extremes are so different when we talk about inflammation here a mild acute sprain of the knee with a mechanical directional preference to motor autonomic where we have a full blown cortical disinhibition and smudging within the homunculus. 
But as we discern those little ones, right? Inflammation to ischemia, hmm. Ischemia to an entrapment in a nerve, hmm. To those central nervous systems, widespread pain. To the idea that something could be psychosomatic where the war within me could be manifesting in me, right? That's a continuum. So how do we do this? We do this through assessment. We do this through assessment and getting to the nitty gritty and understanding the funnel method that as you hold true to the assessment of the sensory and attentional dimension and then prepare yourself because the effective dimension has a lot of information. And even with that, over the last 30 years, we have great agreement on what that should look like. The concerns of fear thinking and avoidance behaving, the concern of my confidence within my mortality and my pain control and the condition management and my return to normal life and my ability to cope with the highs and the lows and the oh, God, oh, the oh gods and how well I look at sleep. Sleep is a big factor. And this thing called readiness or willingness and understanding where they are on that continuum. Because this funneling of information will lead to what I always like to say, the way scale. Two possibilities and now I'm ready to go in there like a good criminal science investigator and interrogate those things, honestly, with a purpose. Because it's important. It's important to understand where they are because it guides your education, it guides your active care. And it makes this more simple because this idea behind pain management Cure doesn't lie in manage, cure lies in treatment. And we need a different mindset. We need to know, should I be managing? Should I be treating? And we need to flip the system. Treatment should focus on knowledge and words and moves, prescriptive movements. It should focus on foods and lifestyle habits. And then we should look for hands and modalities and pharmacies and procedures. And this question, I love this question. Should I be doing pain management or should I be doing pain treatment? Which comes first and when? Because they both have value in place. And again, it's these little characteristics along the continuum of readiness that allows us to understand that question. You know, the worst ever is when you put somebody who's so much ready and desiring pain treatment into a management program. I've watched that for 35 years. They get kicked out at two weeks. And it's so also terrible when you're in a single service situation, especially as a physical therapist, shove in pain treatment with your CBT and your pain science education when this one's clearly telling you they're ready for management prior to treatment. I don't have to tell you this, you know this. And approaches were never meant to conflict or combat. One is better than the other. They were there purposely for where the patient is. Motivational interviewing, gosh, what a great approach when you are dealing with someone who's pre-contemplated. And we all know the pre-contemplated patient. Two words, yes, but, yes, but. And acceptance commitment therapy, I, I love the approach for when people are in those contemplated states. And we all know contemplation. They have the disease of I know, I know, I know. I need to do that, but I can't. It doesn't mean I won't. And mindfulness and keeping them present and helping them commit to choices of value, 
from session to session could move them along to a real action phase where cognitive behavioral techniques and pain science education and I want to know more have great value. So as I'm going to summarize and close this out with a little fun, as we walk through the pain continuum, because there is five steps to a pain-free life. Now I'm going to do this wearing my lampshade because we're going to use the analogy behind a lamp. We all know this. I have not found a better way at helping people understand the pain continuum from a clinical perspective, but understand how the system works from just a human perspective. So when your lamp at home doesn't turn on, what do you do? When your body hurts, what do you do? And we're gonna take the electrical system and the body brain system, and we're gonna walk through steps. So easily, we all know this step one, my lamp doesn't go on, I'm checking that bulb. Couple bulbs, shoot, ain't the bulb, I'm flicking that switch. But what is that in the body brain system? Hey, I'm checking for signs of injury. I'm checking for signs of chemical inflammation. I'm ruling in and ruling out directional preference. I'm establishing whether or not I should be abolishing pain or <laughs> ischemia, creating pain, no pain, no gain. Well, I'm remodeling tissues. I'm remodeling functions. I have put 24 bulbs in. I'm flicking the switch. My lamp still doesn't turn on. My body still hurts. Step two, what is that in the lamp? That's, hey, let's check the cord. Let me, let me look for kinks in the cord. Let me look for bundles. Let me stretch this out. Let me make sure it's plugged in. Well, what is that in the body brain system? Let me maybe not look at the local tissue. Let me look at the global tissue. Maybe this is a referred situation. Maybe that nerve's gotten snagged in the system. There's an entrapment, whether it's at the motion segment with a directional preference, a space occupier, a tight scaling, a tight piriformis. Maybe I need to do some neurodynamic sliders as I work those entrapment sites. Maybe it's not trapped at all. Maybe it's just tight and it needs to be remodeled through good neurodynamic loading. Well, I'm sliding, I'm tensioning. I've straightened this cord out and my lamp still doesn't work. My body still hurts. The beautiful part to step one and two is how crafty we are at looking at what we can see. But for us to move on, to discover our own salvations, whether it's the lamp or my body, is my ability to move to the things that are unseen. And what is that in the lamp? hey, maybe I popped a circuit. Maybe it was that sister. She was blow drying her hair, microwaving. She blew a circuit and I gotta go down there and flick the switch. What is that in the body brain system? Maybe I need to start mm, looking for faulty circuitry and how I'm thinking about the problem. Maybe I'm thinking there's damage and danger when it's really safe. Maybe I'm cognitively misinterpreting the nociception and I gotta flip the switch. So I'm gradually exposing myself back to the things that I view are harmful to me. I'm confessing out loud how safe this is. I flicked every switch in that circuit breaker and my lamp still doesn't work. My body is still hurting. Well, this is the time, isn't it now? I'm going to have to get on the phone. I'm going to have to call that electrical company because they did not alert me of a power outage in my area. 
Well, what is that in the body brain system? I've got to start looking deeper. I've got to look within my emotional centers, within my social centers for any conflicts or triggers or areas that I may not be reconciling. How I'm coping, how I'm sleeping, how I'm eating, how I'm living. Maybe my brain is causing a power outage in my body relative to war going on within me. It's real. My brain's just protecting me from me. Well, I start confessing and positive psychology and I'm meditatively writing and I'm reconciling and I'm looking at a valued life and I've gradually brought myself back to things that bring reward and pleasure. I have been on the phone with these people for a half hour. I have worked up the hierarchy. Everyone's telling me there's nothing wrong, no power outage. Finally, a very seasoned person gets on the phone and they say, hey, you know what? There's only one other possibility to why your lamp isn't working. We know what it is. There's this little box on the pole and sometimes, sometimes, it loses recognition of your home. We're gonna send a guy out there, he's gonna climb up the pole, he's gonna re-image your home to that box and your lamp's gonna work. Well, what is that in the body brain system? Sometimes your brain will go to levels of protection where it just forgets about you. It neglects, it doesn't recognize, it re-images, it smudges. We've got to look and check how well the brain is recognizing the body because as we reestablish the connection between your brain and body through good graded motor imagery, good left-right discrimination, good progressive localization precision, well, you're all sitting there going, Wow, could it really be that simple? I like to think it can. Remember I said, I believe. And to achieve, it's the assessment of the pain continuum, which means I will accept, right? That the extremes from just normal, 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 no susception, good old fashioned end range compression and tension and thermal is varyingly different and identifiably different from somebody who's going through motor autonomic cortical disinhibition or reorganization. And the ones in between are discernible, but difficultly, difficultly discernible, but can be discerned if we do the assessment from surgical to chemical to rectional preference, right? To contracted weak tissues, to treating function, to understanding the nerve, whether it's tight or trapped, to looking in the brain at, is this thinking and believing to coping? Am I treating their story or am I treating their sorrow? This idea behind classification, it helps us and it prevents us from doing the same old thing. Because as we know with every N of one, it's the right treatment for the right patient at the right time relative to the right subgrouping, Right? Am I pathoanatomical injury or disease or am I pain mechanisms, recovery and remission? And which one, where on the pain continuum are they? There is a simple side. Now, as I leave you and challenge you,
look for every article you read, look for every speaker you hear and ask yourself, what part of the continuum are they talking about? And let's be a light because by your words, they can see where you're going like a beam of light on their dark path and they'll commit themselves to a new understanding. And that is the way that we're going to walk people to an identifiable pain free life. These are the references that I use for this lecture today. And probably the most important two words I have for you is thank you. You can reach me at a world of hurt too at gmail.com. And I want to end. Uh, I, as I said, the, the proceeds for this book go to a fund that was created by Mike, uh, Mike Cage, because this really was his journey that he took us all on. And I love the quote that he had the quote that, hey, painful things are not the enemy. They're a signal and they're a signal sometimes just simply telling us it's time to make a change. It's time to improve, it's time to heal or it's time to embrace life. Thank you for attending today and I look forward to talking to you real soon.